Arts from All That You Touch, Art and Ecology. Uh, this is the second of three online conversation series with the artists from this exhibition. And we're really excited um, to have here today, Katie Dorame and Barnali Ghosh. I'm Glory Simmons, uh, the director of the Thatcher Gallery. Um, while the exhibition is in person, our public programs um, will be virtual. And we have two more really exciting conversations um, for you um, in the next two weeks. So tomorrow, the third in this conversation series um, uh, will be at five o'clock. And that is featuring um, USF professor Sam Mickey and artist Nicole Dixon, Connie McKinsey, and Manoush Zamarodinia. Um, focusing on ecology and culture. And then we have Indigenous Foodways on next Wednesday, 6.30 to 8, a conversation and cooking demonstration with Vincent Medina and Louis Trevino of Makam Hom, Contemporary Ohlone Cuisine. Um, in addition to these public events that are online, we also um, have a lot of programming that is in person and for the USF community. So please check out our um, upcoming events page to learn more about those. To begin today's um, conversation, we'd like to um, start with a land acknowledgement. The Thatcher Gallery at the University of San Francisco sits on the um, unceded land of the Ramatush speaking people of the Yelamu tribe, one of approximately 50 independent nations now referred to as Ohlone. The Ohlone people are still here, working for their right to remain and evolve in the place we consider San Francisco. In recognition that we all benefit from this place, we encourage you to learn about the indigenous communities in the spaces you inhabit, Acknowledge the difficult truths of our shared histories and the ways in which these continue to shape our lives. Inform yourself about current land issues and become a steward of these cultures and ecologies and center and amplify indigenous voices in these spaces. We recognize the rich cultural heritage that has survived colonization and genocide and honor Ohlone artists past, present and future. And today, especially as we consider sh our shared ecologies, the land, the air, water, and the many uh, forms of life that we all participate in, um, we invite all of us to um, consider the and learn more about indigenous approaches to caring for the environment. And we'll be sharing um, a resource in our chat. Before I pass over the Zoom stage, I wanna tell you just a little bit about um, the exhibition and introduce our three speakers today. All That You Touch Art and Ecology presents artists whose creative practices are informed by their personal encounters with the natural world. Working across the disciplines, these 10 artists ask, what can nature teach us about adaptation, regeneration, and healing? what can nature teach us about ourselves? Uh, this exhibition is the first of three exhibitions we're um, presenting this season um, that are kind of focusing on the environment and environmental justice. Uh, and this exhibition last is up through November 7th and we would love to see you in the gallery for that. So I'm really excited um, to be able to collaborate again with moderator Vijaya Nagarajan. She is an associate professor in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies and in the Program of Environmental Studies. Vijaya's academic interests weave among the fields of Hinduism, environment, gender, ritual, and the commons. Vijaya has been devoted to the environmental movement for several decades in both India and the Bay Area. She is the co-founder of the Recovery of the Commons Project and the Institute for the Study of Natural and Cultural Resources. 
Her most recent book is Feeding a Thousand Souls, Women, Ritual, and Ecology in India, an Exploration of the Kalam. Uh, braiding to Meal Women's Voices and the author's own stories, Feeding a Thousand Souls brings an, into conversation different knowledge traditions, including beauty, history, literature, religion, anthropology, mathematics, and ecology. As part of the book launch, Vigia worked with the Thatcher Gallery to invite a number of column artists to USF as part of the Global Women's Rights Forum in 2018. And that's what you're seeing here. Katie Dorame is a Tongva visual artist born in Los Angeles, currently working and living in Oakland. Katie's work has been exhibited widely in the Bay Area. She's been very busy recently, um, as well as places like the Forum and Concept in Santa Fe and the De Sase Museum in Santa Clara. She has attended the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe as an artist in residence and contributed to San, Franci San Francisco MoMA's Open Space Project blog and uh, the Facebook Open Arts Mural Project. In this exhibition, um, she's showing the California Collage series um, where, in which she layers images in order to indigenize iconic California landscapes to challenge dominant histories. Barnali Ghosh is a designer and storyteller and a public transit walking and biking advocate. She's co-founder of, uh, of the award-winning Berkeley South Asian Radical History Walking Tour, which uses storytelling and theater to share narratives of local South Asian American resistance movements. She has curated two art shows that were also linked with the, to these histories, including Our Name is Rebel and Rebel Legacy, both with Kearney Street Workshop. In All That You Touch, um, she, we see uh, these playful photographic self-portraits along as studies of California flowers in a pursuit of joy. So it's my pleasure to turn this over to Vijaya now to introduce, introduce us to the idea of the commons. Hi, thank you, Glory, for that beautiful introduction and really to recall to our collective memories the, the beautiful column exhibition that we worked together. I can't believe it was just three years ago. <laughs> Um, and I'm delighted to be collaborating with you on this project as well. Um, I had a chance to go to the exhibit yesterday and I was so deeply moved by the range of materials and how you would organize the space and the different kind of oralities that were there. Um, and it just it so connects to, I teach a class on the commons, which is required for all environmental studies majors at USF. And in fact, we are here with my commons seminar. Um, they're invisible and visible at the same time, um, and they will be, I will be bringing them in as part of our, our, our work together today. Um, I, you asked me to talk a little bit about the commons and my connections to art and ecology, and um, I got introduced to the idea of the commons in 1983 with a beautiful essay by Ivan Illich, a philosopher and a Catholic priest called The Silence in the Commons. And so I really urge anyone who's interested to take a look at that essay. Um, it came out almost 40 years ago and it was really a landmark essay in terms of connecting the spaces of silence and the commons. And so how much noise and noise pollution uh, can invade our sense of, of, of being um, in, a, in a, both a personal space and a, and a collective space. Um, and one of the things I thought about a lot uh, with the exhibit yesterday is how much and this is a question I hope to ask uh, both artists is, you know, how, where does creativity come from in both of these artists? Does it come out of silence? Does it come out of a kind of festive moment or atmosphere? Like where do they get the, what are their origin stories for the works that they, the beautiful works that they've created? Um, and I think part of my work has also been, you know, the last almost 40 years is to think about the commons as a language, as a, recognizing a way of being because we have 
for the last 200 to 500 years, depending on how you count time or count history, um, we've been obsessed with the self and the making of the individual. Um, and the commons is really another whole entire way of looking at our cosmology and, and seeing the links between different aspects of ourselves and the world around us. Um, and I think the commons was much more prevalent in indigenous ways of thinking and many traditional ways of life throughout the world. And we really have flipped from a commons understanding of the world to a self making of the world as if we make the world um, in which you know, many times we don't. Um, so I've been really interested in, especially with this exhibition, you know, how the commons as a concept, um, as land, water, air, and also even us as commoners, and I would count artists as part of the commoning process, um, it, how do we make a link between the self that we think we are, the kind of edge of our body self, to the larger cosmological self? and all the scales of operation of the commons in between the self that's edge of the body and the edge of perhaps the unknown universe, really, there is no edge in that way. Um, so I think that's part of what I'm trying to understand in terms of these, um, uh, this exhibit. Um, I think that one of the things that's been really moving to me is just seeing how creative each of these artists and all the artists in the exhibit have been in terms of the commons. Um, you see like how they've exploded in a way the edge of the sense of their self. And so that's something that I hope we can talk about more. Um, I hope the noise in, from the commons is not coming in <laughs> so you can hear me. Let me know if I need to put the volume up. Um, so one of the things I, I started with many years ago is cow dung caves in the Ganges environment and the Indian imagination. So I was struggling, I was working on sewage systems and I was working on the column and women's ritual art and I was trying to figure out how to connect them. And the, the, wor the world of the commons really helped me connect both the idea of sewage and trash uh, and waste um, as well as ritual art and thresholds um, because the column turns out it marks the thresholds in South India between the household, the domestic private space and the, the common space. So it's actually a boundary crossing art form that indicates the commons. And the commons is really all that we share, both visible and invisible, um, both accessible and inaccessible. Um, and so I think one of the things we have to really try to understand in terms of the climate crisis is the commons of climate and the climate of the commons um, and how the notion of the commons has been eclipsed by the notion of the individual and how even our way of, we're just reading Amitav Ghosh's The Great Derangement today in our class, in our seminar, and he speaks very eloquently about the way that even the epistemological tradition of the West is constrained by the use of limits of time and space. Uh, you know, how the scene becomes the restricted setting for even novels and how novels mimic the constrainment of sight that the rest of the industrial worldview constrains us from seeing, seeing that which really we're embedded in, which is the natural world. And I think each one of these artists, what they do is break out of that sense of enclosure and really stretch their imaginations and push us in new and interesting and intriguing ways, which I hope we'll explore in our conversation uh, and how those links and connections or how they're reconnecting the world in a way, how they're remembering it um, and restoring it and restoring our vision of even that those things that seem very dis disparate and distanced from each other are actually very deeply connected to each other. Um, so I'd like to start with um, beginning with um, Katie and uh, having her present um, her work for us for a few minutes and for five minutes, and then we'll have Bernali um, also present her work as well. Thank you so much, Katie and Bernali. Hi there, <laughs> thank you. Um, I am going to share my screen and show you a couple of my images from the show. So let's make sure I can do that. Um, 
Um, and in the meantime, I'll talk a little bit about myself. So I'm an artist um, who's been living up in the Bay Area for um, almost 10 years now, or a little over 10 years. And I have mainly, mainly most of my work is about Hollywood. I, I am from Los Angeles originally, and I um, am Tongva on my dad's side, which is the tribe of Los Angeles. So, you know, very, very urban Indian, <laughs> the most urban. <laughs> and um, it's been Hollywood and my connection to being a tri tribal member, but also like having this big industry on top of our land that um, doesn't represent us has been a big part of my work. Um, for this for this show, um, I, um, yeah, I'm having trouble actually showing my screen. So um, if, if you guys want to pull up just an image from my show, I'm not going to talk too much about the images themselves, just about the work. Um, so for this show, I made, um, I made these collages based on this idea of what if you could what if you can see what not everybody else can see around you? Like in, I read an, uh, an essay once about the movie, They Live. It's a John Carpenter eighties movie. And the main guy gets these special sunglasses and he puts them on and can see um, who are the evil skeleton, skeleton like people. And he can see what's behind the billboard advertisements and they'll have Barbara Kruger-esque writings behind them like we're trying to sell you something or um so basically the sunglasses let him see everything that the powers that be don't want you to see and i read an essay once talking about that as native american artists why don't we show what's what happens when we put on our sunglasses like what kind of work would that make and um, i started making these collages this one on the screen um, was for a celebration of the Indian occupation of Alcatraz. And um, for me, in general, when we talk about things that are um, indigenous events, that's when we have visibility. But outside of that, um, it, it, it goes away like that, especially if you're from a tribe from a big city. And um, people forget you exist, et cetera, et cetera. And when you're, when you're native, you see those things all the time. Um, so you, you walk down a street and you can identify that even though there's all these buildings on top, you know that there's stuff under the soil, you know there's shell middens and there's village sites. And um, even if you can't see them, you know they're there. And they've, and they've been there for a long time. And then, so I, I th thinking about the comments, um, thinking about going, and, and the work is in layers too, but when I think about work, it'll be from, you know, all the way down underneath us physically, but all the way up as well. So there's like this <laughs> um, metaphysical and physical connection to like, all the planes that you're seeing. So forward behind you, time, um, things in the past, and then things that you can't see, things that you're walking on top of, and the things around you that are actually there, but th that are still contributing to the environment around you. You know, So we often think about nature as this thing outside of us or just the trees or whatever, but you know, the stones that have built the buildings you're in are part of nature. So like with this whole series, I was thinking of, you know, what do I see with my sunglasses on when I look around these places or look around Los Angeles, like with what I know and um, like who, who are the characters or who, what are the sea animals? <laughs> um, and what are these resources? And I hate that word resources because it's like, 
is like some cultural resources is something we talk about a lot um, in tribal politics, but like cultural resources and something that we're guarding but, and protecting, but like that looking at something like it's a resource to be used instead of um, something we support and is a part of us. Um, so it's, I'm talking about a lot of different things and there's a lot of different ways I can talk about my work, but I think talking about it that way um, makes sense in relation to the to the comments, but definitely if you guys have questions, um, I can talk about anything you want <laughs> later. But thank you so much for having me and th thank you for uh, listening. And um, I look forward to what we're going to hear next. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, that was beautiful. It was really exquisite and so, so related to all the work we're doing in this class on the commons. And, um, and so many questions are brimming forth for myself and I'm sure all my students and also all the public audience that's listening here as well. So thank you so much for that beautiful exposition of your work. Um, I'm seeing your work differently, even as you were speaking it, you know. Um, and so this is very precious. Um, uh, next, I'd like to turn it to Bernali um, and for her, um, you know, description and um, from her perspective, what her work is about. So thank you. Bernali. Thank you. Thank you, Vijaya. Um, such an honor and a privilege to be here in your class uh, and also to be on the same panel as Katie. Um, I was very moved uh, and very intrigued. I'm, Totally want to go back and look at the work. So let me see if I have um, luck sharing my screen because I do have um, a lot of images that I want to share with y'all. Can y'all um, see a title uh, slide? Do you see anything? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Let me try again. Now? Oh, yes, now we can oh. see. Yes, okay. thank you. Um, so again, my name is Barnali and uh, I'm based in Berkeley, Ohlone land. I'm a designer and community historian. And um, one of the things I do is run the Berkeley South Asian Radical History Walking Tour. And that's kind of connected to this project as well, and we can talk about it during the discussion. So I spent about a decade uh, designing what I would call our commons, uh, which is public parks, schools, playgrounds, and streets. Uh, and that is part of what brought me also to uh, the work I'm gonna be sharing with you today. And I'm focusing a little bit on the origins of the work that, you'll, that you uh, see in the gallery. So uh, the project that I'm sharing uh, through the gallery is the, the Unfaithful Recreations, and it's the, with a focus on California's native flowers. Uh, and the project is basically a series of self-portraits uh, where I recreate California native flowers using fabrics. Uh, they're mostly saris and an Indian dance form called Odissi, which is uh, how I developed the pose. Uh, this is the first native flower I recreated, which is the California poppy. It's our state flower. And I did this after I came home uh, after getting my first vaccine shot, uh, because I just felt so grateful to be living here and to have access to the vaccine where uh, so many folks uh, back at home, my friends and family didn't yet have that. Uh, this project was created mostly for social media, and I posted it on the California native plant um, Society Facebook group, and it got a tremendous response. Uh, I was very nervous about posting it uh, in that group and uh, in our discussion. I'm happy to talk more about what, why that was. But the comments and the support, it really sort of kept me going. Um, and so I, it, it turned out that that week was also California Native Plant Week. And so I did one a day um, that week. All of these flowers for flowers, except for the poppy, whose names I didn't really know and who I hadn't looked at very closely. Many of them, you know, grew in the streets uh, around my home. So, I, you know, the, the poppy and the lupin and the corner, they're like in a parking lot across the street from my house. Uh, the, the Douglas Iris is by a park. Um, so I just started seeing the places that I would walk around normally in a very different way. And my eyes were tuned to flowers in a very different way. 
so the interpretation of native flowers, it, it weaves together many things that have shaped my identity. Uh, so my identity, my skills, my point of view, a big part of that is being an immigrant and trying to find belonging in a, in a new place. So um, these doing these recreations has given me a new way to connect with place. But I think for many immigrants, connection to place is often fraught. Um, I grew up in Bangalore, India, which is known as India's garden city, and it's known for its seasonal blooms. Um, you have these beautiful tall trees, jacarandas, gold mohors, rain trees, and through culture and stories, I had relationship with these plants. You know, marigolds that were used in weddings, jasmine in my mother's hair, uh, these little like feathery albizia flowers that we would play with in the schoolyard, red hibiscus in Bengali temples, uh, jasmines and rose blankets um, at Muslim shrines. You know, eating off banana leaves. Um, a lot of these natural elements were just sort of integrated into the way uh, I live my life. And when I moved here, um, I had trouble connecting with what was around me. Uh, I definitely fell immediately in love with the, with the oak tree and this one particular buckeye on the UC Berkeley campus, but I still craved uh, the, the flowers of my childhood. Um, so a lot of um, this work started with me just walking the streets of Berkeley and taking uh, pictures uh, of the plants around me. And I thought I'd share this one because my eyes are definitely thirsty for rain. Uh, and this was, I think, in January, which was the last time um, we had any kind of rain shower. Uh, I also walk the streets a lot at night and I take pictures uh, of plants at night. And a, a lot of times my uh, wanting to to take these pictures is to show something more than the details of the tree. It's really trying to understand the feeling and a, creating an emotional connection uh, to these plants that I see around me. These, this is a uh, picture of leaves. Um, during the pandemic, I did more of these walks and I kept kind of a pandemic diary where I would take a picture and I would express how it, how it made me feel. And you can maybe recognize uh, some of these emotions um, in these pictures that you might have felt during those days of the quarantine. Uh, this again is, is a patch of uh, is grass. Um, and they're all a little bit fuzzy. But the other thing that I did during the pandemic when other folks were making sourdough was I, I did participated in this uh, challenge called the Getty Museum Challenge, where they asked people to recreate famous artworks with things you had at home. And I kind of really took to it, but I decided that I was going to focus on South Asian art and artists. And that's where the sort of floral mimicry that I do, um, I developed a lot of the skills to doing this work. Uh, with this, you know, that's me with eyeliner on my face, recreating one of the oldest sculptures in the world, uh, which is part of the Indus Valley civilization. Uh, humor was always really important to me in, in doing this work. And I hope you see some of that in the flower recreations as well and the stories that I make up about the flowers. Here I am with the lamps in my house, uh, pretending to be my friends. Um, and I think as an immigrant, it's, it's always sort of front and center for me that I don't just belong here. A part of my heart uh, is always back in the homeland. So I did this one um, in response to a hurricane Amphan, which hit Kolkata um, and it took down a lot of trees. Uh, so I recreated Andy Goldsworthy's work, which is on the right, which is made of leaves, and my work on the left, which is made of lentils and, and then spices. Um, I also used it to respond to things like the orange sky, for example. So this is the morning sun on the day of that, that orange sky during the fires that we were having. So back to this, uh, the, the flowery creations. Um, for me, uh, what this has done is it's allowed me uh, to understand more uh, how, about native flowers and their importance to our ecology and biodiversity. I look at flowers more closely now. It's kind of like sketching, but with fabrics um, and, and poses. Um, this one is a, is a flower. Uh, the photo is taken by Amy Patton, who's a rare uh, flower photographer and scientist at the, at the California Native Plant Society. Um, and I hope you, you know, it allowed me to sort of pick up some of the details of the white that you see, the fuzzy white on the inside of the flower and sort of the oniony color uh, of it. And then to me, they look like 
uh, drumming fairies. Um, this one is also a, a rare flower that's found only on one mountaintop in Marin. Uh, this, uh, the flower photo was also shared with me by Amy Patton. And um, I thought it was really funny that I hadn't realized before how hairy flowers were. So uh, it took me a while to figure out how I would uh, sort of evoke that image. Um, I also started to find places here where I could learn more about these native flowers. Uh, this picture of the flowers taken at the Regional Botanic uh, 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 Garden in, in, in Tilden Park. Uh, and they have both uh, sort of rare flowers and, and more common flowers like this bleeding heart. And I think, you know, what it's done for me, um, I think it's just attuned, attuned the way I see the world around me in a very different way. Like this is uh, from a few weeks back when I was uh, hiking along the coast in, in Northern California, along the Sonoma coast. And I saw this gorgeous coast buckwheat. So this is, you know, past spring where you're not really looking for flowers. And I was really intrigued by the pinks and the oranges and sort of the fuzzy leaves which sort of just stood so strongly on that windy coast. Um, and, I, and I took a picture and it was beautiful. But then I went back and the place we were staying, the vacation rental, my eyes started doing this thing where I noticed that the rugs in that place somehow match these flowers. And so then this happened where I took what I had around me and I, and I just couldn't help myself in trying to recreate um, these flowers. So uh, this is an ongoing project. It's one of that I'm still learn, learning, but I love the, the mind space that is, it has put me in. And I'll just end with, I think one of the things that connects all of these things for me is, you know, the, talking about indigenous flowers, talking about Odissi, which is the Indian dance form, talking about the saris that I use. Uh, many of them are, are hand loom or made of cotton. Uh, all of these things have been somehow disrupted by colonialism. And somehow sort of recovering these stories and putting them together is also an effort to sort of um, find joy uh, in, in bringing these sort of back and have them be in conversation with each other. Uh, and for me as an immigrant to find my place um, in this country. So I'll stop with that and I look forward um, to the discussion. Great, beautiful. Thank you, Bernali. That was wonderful, really wonderful. A lot of mysterious questions that we had about how you came to what you did got answered a little bit. So that's great. Um, I just thought I would start with asking, you know, a, a question to Katie and a question to Bernali and then open it up to my class. And then there's also questions coming in from the public as well. And I'll also ask those as well. So the first question I had for Katie um, um, is, you know, I loved your piece of the abalone, the rock and standing. Mm -hmm. um, that was in a, I just stood in front of that just in like awe of what you created there. And I could just stare at it for a long time, you know. And I just wondered, you know, it reminded me of John Berger's Ways of Seeing, a book I read decades ago, you know, but really influenced me deeply. Um, and I thought it's been four decades since I read it, I should go back and read it again after I looked at your piece. But I was wondering, I mean, how you talked about that you're trying to put how you see the world, you know, or how your people see the world that's different, like putting on a different pair of glasses, right? It's almost like those glasses are, I mean, our concepts of culture and nature are so limited in terms of an English. Those don't really match with indigenous languages because, you know, culture and nature are not segregated. They're, they're actually fused together, right? Um, and so I wondered if you could just give us a little bit of, a, of an insight of these three objects that you've chosen, like the abalone, the rock, and standing, and just kind of give us your own coming to that painting or to that sculpture piece. Because I have my own reading of it, but I'd love to know what your reading of it is. <laughs> um, yeah, so I can even, um, I can drop that image into the chat from my website if you guys want to pull it up. Sure, and look at sure. Because um, for some reason I couldn't figure out how to screen share this time around. Um, so it's a horizontal piece that has, um, 
or let me do it to everyone. Panelists and attendees. There you go. Yeah, you can pull that up in the chat if you want. Um, it is a horizontal piece. It has kind of three panels and throughout behind the panels, there's this layer of a couple different images that thread their way throughout the whole thing. So on the very underneath level was this image of an artist's rendition of outer space um, from the 60s. And then on top of, under, on top of that was a large um, whale photograph that gets dissected. Mm -hmm. And then um, on top of that are the panels I created that are abalone, the rock and standing. So the abalone piece, I kind of, thought of it as like a chronological progression too from left to right. So there is a piece of abalone and an arm coming out. Um, I thought about that as a kind of the original people and um, the abalone was really important um, and was used a lot and then <laughs> Um, has had different iterations pop culturally, and it always um, comes in and out of being endangered more recently. But um, that's like an anchor piece. And then the rock, I, I have um, an image of a rock that's from an etching. And I was thinking of it in regards to Alcatraz, because this piece was created also for the um, SF MoMA's open space um, commemoration of the occupant. Occup occupation of Alcatraz. And so like literally the rock, you know, Alcatraz. And I have a hat kind of behind it too. that has the feather in it. That's a recognizable Native American. <laughs> Gotta put a feather on it. And, um, and then the third panel um, is from an image that I found and saw that was a National Geographic um, um, it was a whole article about uh, Native American artists. And this one artist who, I have a really hard time with names. So I, I'm, I'm really sorry for forgetting all these names of like the guy who wrote the essay and this artist. Um, they had taken photographs at, um, at Standing Rock. So um, this idea that there's this continued line of, um, intervention within spaces to um, uh, not only protest, but kind of just do what, what, what is what we do. Um, and what else about this piece is kind of needs explanation. Um, oh, and that, you know, I used this frame in a museum as well on top of it because, and then there's kind of like the water seeping out of that image and going back into the whale and everything in like this cycle. So um, there's this weird connection between like, okay, me, me or other artists, what's the end game for our pieces? Is it just to be up in a museum? What does that mean? Like, how can you affect change just being an artist? Um, and then things that are in museums are valued and like looked at differently. So there's like, this, you know, wanting to like put things that are sometimes brushed aside into the museum frame, um, like the protests, um, maybe that would like get it more attention if it had a gold frame in a fancy museum. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's too much information. <laughs> no, it's never too much, Katie. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I just, I mean, for me, it was like seeing layers of commons interacting with layers of other commons you know, and then also the enclosures that happen on the commons as well. And so it's like seeing, it's sort of this disassociated state that we're kind of taught to be in, but then you're trying to weave it around using those tools, but kind of subverting them in a way, you know, subverting them for a different way of seeing. Um, so it's really, um, it's spectacularly, you know, connected to what we're trying to work with in terms of how do we see the commons you know, I mean, I love the idea that you've connected the night sky, the cosmology with the whale and the deep ocean and, you know, um, and then the frame, how our way of seeing is constrained by these enclosures and by these frames of 
a viewing of you know, what we can't really understand as a whole because we've lost the language of wholeness in a way. Um, and so it's like trying to recover those languages of wholeness and languages of seeing things more connected than apart, right? So with that, I want to just turn it to my class and um, have them, uh, you know, ask a couple of questions. So I might have to have you come up here so that it can be heard. So please feel free to come. Jade, come. Come so they can see you as well. So be sit in the chair so they can have a face to the voice. Hello. <laughs> um, I have a question for Barnale. Um, in the like plaque for your work um, in the exhibit, you mentioned turning personal and systemic trauma into moments of joy. Um, and I know that you kind of have touched on this a bit so far today, um, but I was wondering if you could elaborate on what that looks like for you and how your work specifically tackles those issues. Wow, thank you for that question. And I'll try not to fall apart. Every time I try to talk about some of this, I'm still processing, so it's like right up here. Um, I think, being 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 an immigrant you know even an immigrant of so-called choice and privilege it's still very hard i think to find your place uh, in this country and the city and i often as i've been learning about why and trying to understand why i think part of it is because we're we're on stolen land so there has to be some kind of trauma attached to coming to a country that was sort of built on stolen land uh, but it's not something we are taught like i was not taught that necessarily back at home i was taught christopher columbus uh discovered america and then we're all welcome here so so i think that's that's sort of one that's sort of foundational to how i'm starting to understand my place in this country but in terms of w what is traumatic you know when i do the walking tours which is a part of like creating creating joy uh, for myself and learning about the histories of my community. I feel quite empowered. I feel like I belong in Berkeley, but at another moment I might be standing on the streets and somebody might walk by me and say, go home. And it totally kind of crushes you. When it comes to native flowers, it's sort of similar. When I was uh, practicing as a landscape architect, my understanding of native flowers uh, was really tinged by some of the language that was used. Uh, and this was, say, 20 years ago, so uh, at the beginning of my career, where it, it would be said, you know, there was native, and then there was exotic and invasive. And oftentimes, people like me would be also described as exotic and invasive. So the language of native flowers felt very othering. Uh, but since I stopped practicing and I've been looking more into understanding how native flowers impact our ecology, how they're important to our biodiversity, um, doing you know and me creating this sort of relationship with these flowers a new relationship a new story uh with these flowers that's helped me take moments of pain of othering and told that i don't belong here take that and turn turn that on its head and actually create these images that are so joyous um like i mentioned in the talk when i shared it on the california native plant society facebook group i was very anxious because here i was this immigrant body which i cannot change wearing these clothes that are from my homeland, which I love, and yet I am depicting these, these native flowers. And I, I sort of wondered what that tension um, would feel like for, for some of the folks um, who historically have always said that you kind of don't belong. So it's sort of taking all of those moments and turning it into these moments of joy, which when you look at the picture, all you're seeing is joy and delight, but it's hiding all these layers. So thank you for that question. Thank you, that was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I have another question, um, Julia. Hello, I have a question for um, Katie. So yeah, your work was a really beautiful portrayal and I'm wondering if uh, the connection that you feel with your native heritage, if that was something that has always felt ingrained in you, or if there was like a reckoning that came with time or um, like certain pivotal moments. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, big question. Uh, <laughs> um, well, so 
I grew up um, knowing I was native on my dad's side, um, but there was a real tension between my mother and father over that, I think, because she, long story short, you know, she always felt like um, defensive, you know, because she hadn't dealt with the colonial history or acknowledging it. Um, so, you know, I had it. And then I also grew up at a, a Christian school that where I got taught the Columbus stuff and the, the doctrine was very much like I tried to hide it at school as much as possible. Like they would have the Thanksgiving pageants where all the students would dress up um, as pilgrims and Indians. And I'd be like, I don't want to go to school <laughs> or I'll dress up as a pilgrim, like get me out of here. <laughs> um, so like throughout my life, it's been really interesting. And then meanwhile, I would go with my dad to powwows and events. So like there's, um, you know, hybridity plays a lot in, in my work. And I think, you know, through various stages of my life and especially becoming an artist was always like, well, how do I talk about this? Or how do I introduce it? Because when you introduce it, then people want you to make work about it in school where it's like, if people didn't want it from me, it probably would be even more in my work because I, you know, you have expectations and then, um, then you just want to like buck all, exp or I do, I'm always like, I'm going to make what you don't expect from me. Um, and then, you know, at a certain, then there's, that was like the undergrad, then like grad school level, you come into your own a little bit more. And, um, I, uh, I think you get to a point where you're like, okay, well, aside from what anybody expects from me, like, what do I want to say? And what do I want to make? And what difference do I want to make in the world? And so that's like another layer. And then another layer was I had a kid and he's almost two. And after I had that kid was when I made these collages, collages which were like the most personal that I've made so far and like actively talking about like my like specific tribal identity. Um, normally I'm more gen uh, like I keep more of a distance. And I think it was because like I had him, the pandemic happened and it was like, okay, what's important to you? And like, it's almost like I made them without this expectation that anyone would ever see them. And that like freed me up to talk about it more than I ever had because of expectations. And like I said, if I'd never had those expectations to begin with, maybe it like the work always would have been really open and honest. So, um, you know, I've heard other, other marginalized community members like talk about that the expectation versus like, you know, like if you're a part of a museum committee and like, if you're black, you're expected to speak about diversity and then everybody, you know, like, so there's like, yeah. So there's a lot of different layers that's happened over the years and like how I've connected to that and like talked about it. Um, but yeah, big, big, big question. <laughs> Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. I have one more, two more students, um, Aurora. Yeah, she's coming and it's gonna be a question for both of you. So Katie, you might as well stay on and then turn off. Hi, um, so you both had touched on your personal experiences um, in displaying your artwork. And I think for many art, expresses lived experiences that we can't see or hold in a tangible way. So um, I, I think we can all feel connected and, and feel less alone into turning into feelings that we're afraid of. So I'm curious um, with your works that are displayed in the Thatcher Gallery and just displaying your, your work in general, is that a vulnerable experience for you? And how do you push through that? <laughs> Um, yeah, it's vulnerable. And the more personal the work, the more vulnerable too. Um, uh, I think having safe 
spaces. And I mean, I really like showing at um, places that are connected to academic institutions because um, a commercial gallery starts getting weird too. Um, but I think, I think if your intentions are there and people open up and have conversations with you, even if there's something they're not understanding, um, that's what's important. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I think for me, um, every time I walk on the street, I feel vulnerable because of how I look. Um, especially post 9-11. Um, it's because of how I dress. I always dress in, in my sort of Indian clothes because that's what I enjoy. Um, but I think I've, this is the first time I've shared it, uh, created work that has allowed me to sort of push through those insecurities uh, I have about, n n not only about like being, being in a brown body, but also what my brown community often tells me about how I look. Like, is your hair, is your hair right? Uh, are, are you too big? Are you too thin? <laughs> you know? So I think a big part of, of my work where the work is me, it's my body, I'm embodying the work, um, you do sort of set yourself up for maybe some critiques. Uh, and that that was, was, was very, very scary because for decades, um, I, you know, I was somebody who would hide under my clothes. So, um, so yes, I'll say that, um, but at some point, um, I just learn a lot from from like other folks around me, especially I think from like younger folks who share their vulnerabilities with which much more uh, courage than than I was able to before. And um, ultimate, you know, and when I was doing the art recreations, also, you know, I took some risks with doing those art recreations where. I was using my body in all these different kinds of ways and using it in funny ways and sad ways uh, and ways that were not very uh, traditionally attractive. Um, and I think that gave me like some courage to finally present myself without sort of the face paint, without all of that, uh, to put my body on, on display. But, but it's, it's still a struggle. It's, it's still a struggle. You know, there's some, I had surgery, there's a scar in there that shows up in the photos. So there are still layers that I'm not talking about because I'm not ready about, ready to talk about it yet, but they're all there. And for me, I look at them and um, I give myself a pat on the back sometimes for doing that. Um, yeah, and, and I think what makes me happy is just I want other people to sort of see it and feel happy because we've all been through a lot of shit this year, so. Thank you. Well, thank you. Hello, um, my name is Gabby. Um, <clears throat> and I just wanted to ask, um, I know this um, artwork has been very uh, influential to, to both you and um, the, the people who are looking at it. And I wanted to, to ask if this, type of artwork or if these specific pieces have shaped the way you are going to further look at your artwork or for the, further portray yourselves um, within your artwork. It's for both of you guys, so either one. <laughs> um, yeah, I think this has started, I, I work in, I work, in bodies of work. So like each one will have a theme and I'll kind of go for it. And um, I think this has already found its way, this project has already found its way into like, I did a mural for uh, Facebook and um, like some of the collage, I did some collaged elements uh, on a big panel and then painted around it. And so it started, I, I'm realizing it's starting to, weave its way into other parts of my work and then um and then the other part and then another body of work I'm working on is like about gothic horror films so <laughs> like I think that um it's been interesting to do something that's like like a diary personal project and may make it public and then still have other stuff going on um I'm sure at some point it's all gonna <laughs> 
clash. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, yeah, I think I spoke a little bit about, you know, sort of being an immigrant and being on stolen land. And I think I also want to complement that with why many of us are here, which is because our countries were, were colonized um, in, in the case of South Asia, India by the British. And I think through my work, what I'm trying to find is a way to sort of create some healing um, among all of us who, who are experiencing the same trauma but are often placed in opposition to each other. So it's like, how do I repair these relationships in, in my personal life so I can feel a sense of rootedness in this country without some without some of the guilt that comes with, with the discovery of not the Columbus type discovery, but the, but the anti discovery really, right? Um, so, so that's one way that I think personally that this work is impacting me. And I personally do a lot of work around climate change, around, you know, most of my work is around like transportation emissions. Uh, it's about sharing stories of activism. And I think one of the things I find is that um, having a sense of belonging to, to a place really can, can infuse your work with, with like a passion and a motivation that goes, uh, it, uh, that really helps you during, during the tough times. And through, through doing this work, I'm also hoping that other folks who sort of look like me can, can heal and find that motivation and belonging and, and help us sort of get to that place that we need to be. Uh, because if people don't feel like they have ownership of a place, then they probably won't care enough about all of the things we need to do, you know, uh, to take on huge issues like climate change. Um, so, so that's how I'm, I'm seeing the work. I don't know what it's, how my work is going to evolve next, uh, this visual art piece. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hello there. Uh, my name is Gabriel. Um, and my question to both of you, um, you both have such unique and powerful um, representations within your own work. And I'm very curious. Um, I mean, you've uh, made an impact at our, in our university uh, at USF. Um, but moving forward or just considering yourself now, what audience um, and sponsorship or platform you might say do you aspire to reach? And how do you, yeah, so how do you feel about that now or what do you aspire for moving forward? Um, because it's hard to navigate, like, I don't know, reaching people and um, connecting and what spaces, like that representation, what it means is very different depending on the audience, depending on the platform from what I understand. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one because like my whole trajectory um, since school has been like, oh, I wanna be an artist. So that means galleries and ultimately museums, you know, like that's the end goal. Um, and I think as I've developed and kind of <laughs> wised up, <laughs> That, that's still a, a path, but I think that, um, you know, it's very limited in scope who that audience is. And there's two ways of like making that make sense to me is either like figuring out ways to like bring more people into those spaces um, and they would do well to like make their roster more diverse and like speaking to these things. Um, or <laughs> the harder one is finding alternative um, spaces or venues. Um, I mean, not even buildings, like, you know, thinking outside the box. And I'm a very, you know, even though I work with a lot of layers, I'm a very 2D gal. So like, I think that's something that me and my friends have been talking about a lot, especially since the pandemic, you know. Like, so if you have any ideas, <laughs> I'm open. <laughs> yeah, I kind of fell into this in some ways because, you know, the kind of art I was creating early on was like actual landscapes where 
people, hundreds, thousands of people, so people would use them, but not in the way I always wanted them to be used. Um, but this specific work, I wasn't sure what it means to be up in a gallery to print them because it was kind of a social media project. Um, so I'm sort of trying to understand what that means uh, to have it up somewhere. Um, I like that it's of a larger scale. So I would love to see uh, these prints travel to other places uh, to be seen in the same way beyond just the, the screen, which started to feel very confining after all this time. Um, I am continuously resisting making objects because it's, I, I, my, I feel very minimalist, not, not in a self-righteous way, but I, that's just who I am. And so I've had folks ask me to print calendars or, you know, stuff like that. So there's a lot of people who want calendars. I might make some calendars for this year. Um, yeah, but, but I don't know. I think for me, like the, the text that I write with the images uh, is, is, is sort of ideal storytelling for me. So I'd love to be able to sort of speak about the work in a more sort of organic way where the images and what I'm saying about them kind of mix together in almost like a, a film type uh, situation. So folks can experience the whole thing and not just respond to the image. Um, and of course, I mean, I being on social media, I would love for it to go sort of beyond just the, the groups that I posted where where they're well loved, but to be seen by, by more people. I've made them, I want them to be seen by more people. And ultimately, I think some of my favorite reactions that I've gotten have been people saying, oh, you created this and now I recognize this plant. Now I recognize this flower because you created a, a connection for me. And I think that recognizing flowers and plants around you can be very intimidating to people. It was intimidating to me. They have all these Latin names, um, you know, that, that I don't know. So, so I, ultimately I hope that they can become some kind of education and some kind bring about like some kind of connection and healing for folks who don't connect to our surrounding um, flowers and plants in the same way. Um, so, I don't know exactly how to do that. So again, I think like I'm open to all kinds of ideas. If you all have ideas, I would love to hear them. Um, and I also would love for you know your class to share how seeing these sort of makes you feel. For me, a lot of it is about how how these images make you feel. Um, both Katie's, like when I saw Katie's work, I mean, it was just um, you know, seeing those Im like the figures placed on the landscape almost like almost Egyptian, but almost like goddesses, but also, you know, sort of looking over the city. Um, I mean, yeah, I could spend hours with that work, but it, it sort of gave me chills to sort of see those layers one on top of the other. Um, thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you. Hi, um, I'm so happy that I've gotten to hear both of you speak. And I had a general question that I've been kind of thinking about. So I, in South Asian culture and Desi culture, I feel like art is really just a way of life, like in our typography and our rickshaws and our trucks and food and everything, art just, it doesn't feel separate from life. And I'm sure it's the same in Native, Native American cultures as well. Um, and I guess I was just wondering how, how you begun this journey of making art as a way of life instead of just making art to create art. And then how, I guess it's a two part question. And then how can someone like me or my classmates who may not be artists begin these healing rituals um, that are creative, that are artistic, but feel very disconnected from our like capitalist pre-colonial way of life. Yeah, that's, that's my question. Barnali, do you wanna take this one first? Um, it's fine, you can go first. Or I, I can go, okay, I'll give you a break and I'll go first and you can think about the question. Um, yeah. I mean, you're so right. I think, you know, um, that's one of the things I sort of missed about being here 
uh, as an immigrant is not figuring out how all of the art that I took for granted that was around me uh, just kind of like disappeared. Um, and, you know, like we're uh, Vijaya's class and talking about Rangoli and how that's like, that's how starting your morning by like drawing is it's such, it just feels so, makes you just feel alive immediately to, as it appears to me. And I think for me, we do kind of separate out, I think, art and crafts and museum art and, and you know, it's all sort of separated out. Uh, so, so it does become sort of um, challenging. So like, what is art ultimately? Is it something that a woman in a village is painting on her wall? Or is it something that's up in a gallery here in San Francisco? You know, um, I struggle with those questions all, all, all the time. I think for me, I started uh, cre uh, doing these creations as part of like processing a, a lot of um, emotions during the pandemic. And I also was very intentional about in my art recreations to not focus on the old masters, which is sort of what the challenge was set up to be and to really focus on South Asian artists, South Asian art and Asian American uh, artists and women artists. So some of the recreations I did were um, like you were saying, it, it was like truck art from Pakistan. So I did a, a, so a recreation of a truck art in Pakistan that was celebrating Pride Month. Uh, I did matchbox covers, which has so many, it has amazing images, matchbox covers from South Asia. Uh, so I recreated those. And through that, I just learned so much about our more, what we call, what I would call, like in architecture, we say like vernacular, which is just sort of the everyday and, and sort of common person's um, our art and expression. Um, and it, it just taught me uh, a lot. Uh, to your question about how how does somebody like like you do it i think for me i went to things that that they really have to make bring you joy in some way i think the way i was doing that was really by photography and it, it has to let you observe the world in a way that is different some people do that by drawing even if you're a terrible you're terrible at drawing, just trying to draw anything immediately makes you see the world differently. So it's also not to focus so much on the end product, but on the process, because I think ultimately it's the process that that brings you uh, the initial joy. Um, my friends create art through baking, you know, so like there's really no limit to like cooking is an art form as well. So I would say start with something that is is small, but that makes you really happy um, and, and what I've learned from the folks who are like artists around me, I don't really, I don't know how to call myself an artist yet. This is my first time having my art up in a gallery. So, but what I've learned from folks is also doing it like every day or doing it, doing it often, I think can also sort of help build like a perception and a skill, uh, about a certain object that you might be interested in. So I don't know if that was helpful. <laughs> It was. Thank you. Um, yeah, the only thing I can add to that is if you want to do something you, you love and love making, um, don't go to grad school for fine art. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, <laughs> no, it's, you know, you have to, uh, you love something and then you, you hate it and you have to find a way to love it again if you do that. Um, because a lot of, you know, Western based art, it's all about criticism. It's all about like, um, looking at something and looking at what's wrong with it. And, um, if you are good at doing that, imagine, and if you're your own worst critic, like imagine the possibilities of how you can like, just annihilate yourself and your work. Um, so, <laughs> so run away. No, <laughs> um, or like I said, if you're doing it, like find a way to accelerate the process of getting out of that um, relationship with it. And then going back to like a healthy relationship with your work. Cause it is, um, yeah, and that's what I call it too. It's my work, you know? And that's another way of, of thinking about it is like, it's work. <laughs> um, and, and a lot of the times it brings joy, but sometimes it's really, it's really hard. And, um, 
And yeah, to kind of ignore those dichotomies between craft and fine art and all those things. Like that's, I think those boundaries are starting to break down a lot more too now. So that's good. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, students in the class. And thank you so much for um, Bernali and Katie for giving really beautiful nuanced answers. I think everybody got a giggle, Katie, when you said not to go to an MFA, you know, get a master's in fine arts. It was a real laughter. I don't know if you heard it, but I think students are really needing and looking for direction in this time of kind of, you know, you have, I mean, we're in 2021 and there's all kinds of imaginations of endings, right? 2030, and, and so what, you know, how do you spend this time? What, where do you put your bodily energy and mental energy and, and psychic energy towards? So I think it's, it's really, really helpful to have students be able to get a glimpse, especially of your process of making, uh, because I think that's, that's a hard thing to get at, you know? Um, so I had a whole list of questions with me, but I, I'm really delighted that my students asked so many questions. And, um, and so I just want to thank you really deeply for your presence today in, our, in my classroom and for the public, as well as you know, for our gallery at USF and to have the whole USF community and its surroundings and anyone else on the public um, gaze to be able to enjoy both of your work so deeply. Thank you. Yeah, and now I'm gonna turn it back to Glory. Thank you as well, um, Katie and Bernali and Badia for um, today and for all the students with their questions. That was just fantastic. Um, thank you for being so available and honest, Katie and Bernali. That was really wonderful to hear those answers um, and to really look at your work with you because we haven't gotten to do that in the gallery together yet. So it was a real pleasure to hear your hear you kind of put pull things apart and put them back together for us. So thank you. Um, and I just want to remind everybody who's here to join us tomorrow at five o'clock for another conversation around ecology and culture, which this, ex this conversation was also so much about culture. I, I really appreciated that and thinking about how that connects with the commons. Uh, so tomorrow's will be with Sam Mickey and artist Nicole Dixon, Connie McKinsey, and Manoush Zamarodinia. Um, and I also wanna just say thank you to the, um, our kind of collaborators for this event, the Craze at USF, as well as the Theology and Victoria and everybody else who is behind the scenes. So have a really good afternoon and I hope to see you in the gallery soon. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.